This is a Q&A lesson on practicing scales, and thank you to all my Patreon followers for submitting questions today. Uh, follow the lesson for free, but if you're interested in supporting the channel and these free lessons, there's a link for the support page in the description, and there's free ways to support um, or financial ways, uh, whatever you're comfortable with. So before I get into all the questions, and there's quite a few, let me just talk about the reasons why we practice scales and some resources as well. Because I think to some extent, my reasons for practicing scales partially answer most of the questions today. So I can refer back to it instead of repeating myself. So let me just list them and then I'll talk about each one. So one reason is physical technique. You know, the actual physical aspect of practicing scales is good for our physical technique. There's also fretboard knowledge. Understanding how music works on the fretboard. Um, there's also a reading music and a theory aspect. So those two things are, are intertwined, and we'll talk about that as well. And then also, as a fourth reason, um, I think like ear training and memory work, I think it really benefits those two things as well. So let's just talk about those. So physical technique. You know, if you practice a variety of scales in different octaves and different places in the guitar and all the right hand fingering combinations like I am or M-A or P-I or... AMI, like all the fingering combinations, that prepares you for playing. It's also good for your synchronization of your two hands. Um, also, there's no real substitute for scales. You know, if you play a two or three octave scale, um, it requires... It requires an incredible amount of evenness to go from point A to point B. And that evenness and consistency in your playing, as well as relaxation, being able to play through it and relax and just have complete evenness, that's a real skill. And it's, it's not always easy to get that from your repertoire. So a lot of the times when I'm working on those topics, like consistency and evenness and relaxation, I'll use scales to practice it because it's just a really good, um, simple way of exploring those topics instead of like all the oddities and complications that come up in repertoire. So physical technique we might practice scales now fretboard knowledge if you're just memorizing fingerings you know you're just thinking or you're using tab um, you know i don't think you're really learning that much about the fretboard but if you're actually engaging with the scale and you're thinking about like oh where can i do the shift or in a melodic minor scale like where's the sixth and seventh degree that i need to raise or lower on the way down um you know, if you're actually engaging with the scale, you will kind of understand how music works on the fretboard, and it'll get you really thinking about the fretboard. I'll often have my students say the note names of the scales out loud, and just by even saying the note names out loud, they'll learn that area of the guitar really well because they're saying the note names instead of just memorizing fingerings, right? So fretboard knowledge. The third topic was reading music and music theory and playing in key signatures. So if I'm playing a piece in the key of A major, for example, and I'm playing it in the fourth position of the guitar, well, if I know an A major scale there, those are the notes that are going to be used, and that, that, those, that's the fingering I'll probably use, because I know, oh, A major, it has those notes and those fingerings. So by knowing that, there's a connection between reading music and being able to, to read music and sight read music really well, and music theory, and playing within a key. So, you know, in books like Aaron Shearer's Scale Supplement, he presents a scale and then has you read through a ton of melodic material using that scale. That's to show you the, the pattern and then how you use that pattern to read music. And uh, that, that's an incredibly important aspect of practicing scales. I think a lot of students miss out on that because they don't use a method book or, or a system that allows them to try that out. Instead, they just kind of memorize fingerings and memorize scales. They don't really know why, but it, maybe it's just for physical technique. But when you actually make the connection between reading music and, and scales, uh, at least in melodic work, or in harmonic too, um, then it's very clear to you why you would want to read scales. It's, it's part of the system of reading music and, and understanding music. 
Now, ear training and memory, um, by playing the different scales, you really are, even if you don't think about it too much, by osmosis, you are, you are training your ear to recognize, you know, major and keys and minor keys and melodic minor and and you're you're engaging with that the sound of like a melodic minor how the sixth and seventh degrees change um you you are engaging with ear training to some degree which is really helpful in your musical work because you can make a connection with the musical work that you're working with and also in terms of memory if i know oh in that passage um that's a natural minor scale or that's a um, that's a harmonic minor scale that he's using there. I can memorize a, a chunk of music based on the fact that he's using that scale. I know I can hear it and, and it helps me memorize the music as well. So a whole bunch of ideas there, but those are four reasons why we practice scales. I think the biggest issue is a lot of students are just practicing scales for physical technique and they're memorizing the fingerings and then they're just playing it every day. Obviously, if you go through all my four reasons, there's a lot more to engage with with scales than you might think and a lot more systems that you can integrate. So let me just quickly talk about some resources. So there's individual scale books with someone's fingerings, you know, and and that's interesting in itself. Sometimes that feeds into a system of fingering and playing music and reading music. Sometimes it does not. So like, for example, my technique book, um, has a number of uh, quite a few scales with my preferred fingerings. Some of those are for technique work. Some of those I use for reading music and and understanding how to play a scale over the entire fretboard of the guitar. So I'm like halfway. A lot of some of it is for um, technique work, and some of it is for understanding you know keys over the guitar. And you know then there's things like the like the Segovia. You know, scale book where really I think most people use those basically just to memorize fingerings. Um, I don't think it's it's really a huge system, although he has his own kind of system. But in unless you're working on that book with a teacher, you know, you might not understand the system that much. Other books such as the Aaron Shearer Scale Supplement that's 279 pages of of a scale pattern followed by melodic sight reading using that pattern. So you're actually like learning the scale and learning how to play music using the scale and those fingerings. So there's a real strong connection there um, about why you're practicing scales and how to use it to read music. And I think um, I, I heavily push that, that book. It's 279 pages, so I usually wait until a student is a little bit more advanced. Um, I use my book and some other books to kind of prep the student and get them comfortable before we dive into 279 pages of it. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, that's a real integrated system, not just some someone's fingerings. It's like a system of learning music on the guitar. So um, that's what you want to be thinking. Um, a lot of the questions today, I think, are very much related to using scales for technique work rather than using them as part of a system of understanding music on the guitar. So I just wanted to mention that because to some extent, I think that answers a lot of the questions. So let's dive into the questions now. And um, I've combined some questions and I'm paraphrasing some of them, so I'm not doing them all word for word, just to save some time. So John asks, when would you recommend practicing scales as part of a warm up or a dedicated session? How much thought should be given to what the right hand is doing? Well, I think that a warm-up and, and a technique session are a little bit different things. I think in a technique session, you're really trying to solve technique problems, and you're very much focused on working on that. A warm-up, you might just be kind of like prepping yourself for, for playing and getting your fingers just a little organized, right? So I think both, um, they, I think they belong in, in both. Um, everyone has to decide what they need to work on in their technique sessions, but I think scales are something you have to maintain on a regular basis. So I think they should definitely be part of your everyday technique session. It doesn't have to be a ton of scales, just a little tiny section dedicated to scale work. Because again, I think there's no substitute for, for playing like a two or three octave scale. That's a lot of control and consistency you need to play that scale. And I think there's not much of a substitute. In terms of what the right hand is doing, absolutely, you must pay. It's both hands. 
part of scale work is is the right hand going through all the combinations you know i am m a um, i a a m i p i p m you know like there's tons of scale fingerings you can use and by learning all of them you are training yourself to be ready for anything that comes up in repertoire so absolutely you're definitely looking at that and in the left hand you know you're training your left hand uh, left hand finger independence and a whole bunch of legato work and a whole bunch of different aspects in the left hand and also synchronization between the two hands so it's all very important um john and martin have a, a similar question so i'm kind of paraphrasing here uh is it better to practice challenging passages in your music instead of scales as in not that practicing scales aren't good for you but is it as efficient as other technique work and exercises you could be doing? For example, such as the Giuliani left hand studies. Um, I've touched on this quite a bit already, but I think that there's no real substitute for doing like a long scale. If I'm working on a, an etude with a student, such as like Kirkassi etude number one, you know, although we could practice scales in, in small chunks in that piece, um, there's other like complications, you know, the, the octave jump at the beginning, um, the fact that the scales are, are quite a bit shorter. A lot of the time, if I see inconsistencies in a student's playing, I will really want them to just play me a nice, simple, you know, two octave scale. And I want to see if there's any issues with a nice, simple scale. It's like, it's easier for me as a teacher to go right to the source of the problem rather than deal with the oddities of a musical composition. So by dealing with a nice simple scale where it's just one note at a time and I'm listening for legato and I'm listening for rhythmic consistency, um, it's just right to the source of the issue. And I think scales really address a whole bunch of those issues and they're quite challenging in that regard. So um, although there's tons of great exercises for left-hand independence, such as the Giuliani left-hand studies, they're not substitute for scales in my mind. Um, I think you have to do both, and I know that means a lot of practice and a lot of different sections to your practice session, but it's a long-term thing. You just do a little bit of each one, and you try to include it all. But I don't think there's a substitute for scales. Uh, Martin asks, what is the reason to invest time in the melodic and harmonic minor scales as suggested in your technique book, as opposed to just doing major scales, for example? Well, uh, music is written in major keys and it's written in minor keys and, you know, the fingering connections that we make and understanding how those scales work will allow us to understand our music better, understand the fretboard harmony better, and just all those reasons I, I've already kind of described. But, and also, you know, your training. There's also just the variety aspect. I mean, some melodic minor scales require um, a particular type of shift or a harmonic minor scale might, you know, have a shift with using different fingers that you wouldn't get in a major scale. So um, I think that the, even just the variety of the different scales offers a lot to your physical technique on top of all those musical reasons why we might do it as well. So Robert asks, what is your opinion regarding practicing the Segovia scales? Um, and I already talked about this a little bit, um, but... They're just, they're just scales. Um, the Segovia scales are just scales. And they're, they have his recommended fingering. Um, I don't, you know, and there is a system to his fingering. Uh, but I, I don't find it, you know, like a completely... It, it's good. I have no problem with it. But there's individual people's fingerings for scales. And then there's scale systems. Learning people's fingerings for scales is great for technique work. But, you know, it doesn't come up in repertoire that often where we would play like a two octave major scale shifting from that position to that position. It just won't come up that much. So when you look at the, the Shear book and how his system of fingering and comprehensiveness of it, uh, it has a lot more practical application than learning someone's just individual fingerings. It really just depends on how you're using them and how you're engaging with them and why. So, yeah, um, his book is just one possibility for, for fingerings and concepts, but um, there's a lot of other ones out there. And I think these days there's a lot of, a, you know, real comprehensive of programs you can look at. Even I think my books, to some extent, 
um, have a system that you can end up using quite a bit. Um, going over like, you know, just individual octaves and then combining them instead of like learning just two and three octave scales is really helpful. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, he also asks, Segovia recommends using rest strokes to practice scales. Do you think it is better to use rest stroke or free stroke? You have to practice both. Uh, you're, one of the reasons you're practicing is to prepare yourself for repertoire and your repertoire might require one or the other. It might sound better, it might be more appropriate, it might clean up the sound or, or do something to the sound. So you want to do both. You're preparing your hands for, for anything. I want, after my technique session, I want my hands to be ready for anything that comes up. So that means practicing all the different combinations. Um, Robert and, and Klaus have similar questions about practicing scales of PM or PI or PAMI. I think all fingerings for scales are really worth practicing. PAMI is a little bit challenging, especially for students, and the thumb, you know, has to get in there, but it's very good for your right hand precision. I wouldn't use it to play like an extended scale passage, but um, it's good practice, absolutely go for it and practice it. PI scales and PM scales are very useful. Um, I use that in repertoire sometimes, so I find that useful. But again, all the combinations prepare you for anything and might also have a real benefit to your physical technique. So I definitely recommend it. Okay, so Shravan asks, and I'm paraphrasing quite a bit here, but he's saying, he's asking, I'm thinking that I'll spend several months on a single scale and only move on to the next major scale after I have really good control. Is it better to mix up the scales and do more than one or different ones every day? Uh, I would recommend that you split that into two areas. So on the one hand, you should have a balanced practice session where you're working on a number of different scales, a number of different exercises, you know, slurs and, and finger independence and arpeggios and all those things. And then if you want to have like an individual program where you where an individual section of your practice where you really focus on practicing an individual scale really well, at like a challenge scale, um, by all means, go for it and do that. But I think all, you need a little bit of variety because... You know, sometimes if you practice just one thing, then you're just focusing on certain finger groups and, and certain things. You're not like getting a balanced feel in your hand. So I would practice a good variety of easy scales that you can practice really well. And then if you have one that's giving you trouble, definitely just focus on that one. You know, if you've been doing just one octave scales, keep practicing a whole bunch of those. But if you're then working on a two octave scale that you find challenging, Yes, focus on that two octave scale until you can have it under control, but you still need to have a lot of variety in your technique because it's beneficial to all your fingers and the way your hand balances itself out. Dan Ng asks, is there any benefit to knowing and practicing many different kinds of scales as opposed to simply major and minor? In jazz, for example, the music theory knowledge one derives from scales seems important, but is this useful to classical guitarists as well? Um, also, do you think that one can become competent without practicing scales at all? So um, I think that there's a huge benefit to practicing all sorts of different scales. You know, it prepares you for all sorts of different types of music. And, and also I want to understand music theory on the guitar, so I, I go after everything. Um, although I'm a classical guitarist, I, I am interested in jazz, and I did go to like jazz college for a little while, and um, so I I did learn you know a lot of different scales and how the major scale translates into all the modes and and all those systems. But also you know if you take enough music theory classes, you you end up um, also understanding all the theory behind all the different scales, and that can translate to your instrument as well. I think at high levels, classical guitarists definitely need to know all this stuff because it's in the music, um, in, especially in modern music or early music and, you know, the different eras. There are different scales that are used and, um, and you want to know them. You want to know everything and so you can understand it and know when you hear it in the music or, or if you see it in the music where you're going to play it on the guitar. There's lots of different applications. 
And um, I also think that classical guitarists should learn how to improvise a little bit as well. So um, knowing some of that, you know, a, jazz is a great way to, to get into that stuff. So, yeah, I, of course, I definitely think it's important. I think ignoring th music theory of any kind or, or music on the guitar, um, ignoring stuff is just is bad. But, of course, there's time constraints. So, you know, you can introduce it at different levels in your progress. Not all at once. Um, do I think people can become competent without practicing scales at all? Because of those four reasons I discussed at the beginning, I think no. Um, I'm not saying that someone couldn't play a piece for me and the piece would sound really good. I think someone could definitely do that. They could definitely learn a piece, make it sound very good. I would listen to them and I would say, great job, that sounded beautiful. But that doesn't necessarily make them a competent musician. And their understanding of, of music and music on the guitar might be would be less than other musicians and and there would definitely be situations that they would eventually encounter if they got to high levels anyway um that they would be out of their element then and so i think that's a bad idea i always have to prepare my students with the thought that one day they might go for it and so i can't ignore things you know um, i have to make sure they're prepared for the future and so practicing skills is an essential part of that so Richard asks, my question has to do with left hand position above the 12th fret when playing relatively quickly. Should the parallel position of the hand be maintained or is it okay to go into violinist mode with a slanted hand position? You know, like some people when they reach the upper positions might end up going into a slanted hand position as opposed to trying to maintain a parallel hand position. Um, so I have a raised fingerboard, so you can see the, the, the body slopes down, so the fingerboard is, a, is above a little bit. So it's maybe a little bit easier for me to actually get underneath and to play in a relatively parallel position. I think that's just as easy to, well, not just as easy, but um, as um, practical on a regular guitar. Oh, of course, cutaways make it quite a bit easier. Um, on a regular guitar, you just have to put your wrist out a little bit more. But I think I think that your technical aim should be to keep your hand parallel because there's so many benefits to that. But, you know, I'm very practical in this regard. So if a student is in a situation and they just can't keep that practical alignment, then depending on the situation, I would I would let it go a little bit, or at least say meet me halfway, uh, as long as you're not you know going unstable. So the, yeah, as a teacher, my answer is yes. Try to maintain your parallel hand position because the teacher in me wants you to do that, and I think it is better to do that. But the practical human being in me um, is telling you that um, I won't tell if you're successful at playing. <laughs> so, but again, I think there's a difference maybe between practicing technique and trying to like perform a piece. Sometimes when you perform a piece, you gotta do something weird just to make it work because you gotta perform that piece tomorrow. Uh, but when you're practicing your technique, you can go very slowly and do your best to maintain a hand position. So just separating those two things for practical reasons. And the final question, Tal asks, are there scales that sound better on classical guitar compared to other instruments? Um, that's a pretty subjective question. Um, it depends what sound you like. Um, you know, certainly it's hard to compare like a super legato scale played on a flute compared to a, a you know, a guitar played on, a, scale played on guitar where lots of attack is on each note um certainly there are areas of the guitar that have sweet spots you know like i particularly love that sound of a of a scale you know in fifth position or seventh position it's a very sweet spot on the guitar um so that sounds really good but you know some people like different sounds and some some people are charmed by the, the plucky sound of a guitar um when i hear a scale on a lute I find it very pleasing. Um, when I hear a scale on a harpsichord, I find it very pleasing. Other people could be like, no, thank you. <laughs> so I think it really, it really just depends. So I hope you found that useful. But again, 
I hope that when you're now considering scales, that you're considering those four reasons why we might practice scales. You're not just thinking physical technique or memorizing fingerings, but you're really thinking more in terms of, of the benefits of practicing an integrated system of scales and that you start to engage with scales in different ways. So instead of picking up your guitar and just going through a fingering and not thinking about it, maybe you could say the note names out loud to engage with it. Or maybe you could try doing a shift in a place where you've never done a shift before. So you're, you're going to shift up the guitar in a different spot than you usually do and see if you can figure out the rest of the scale based on the key signature. You can engage with scales in lots of different ways and, um, all, and that is the thing that will make you a really competent and well-rounded musician, not just someone who can play a scale really fast, but someone who actually understands what they're doing on their instrument. Uh, so yeah, and when we think about all the questions that were asked, in my mind, those four reasons why we practice scales partially answers uh, most of most of the questions, and it's something good to to think about and engage with um, the next time you practice scales.